Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Garanger July 14th, St. Bonaventure, Cardinal and Doctor of the Church Four months after the Angel of the Schools, the Seraphic Doctor appears in the heavens. Bound by the ties of love when on earth, the two are now united forever before the throne of God. Bonaventure's own words will show us how great a right they both had to the heavenly titles bestowed upon them by the admiring gratitude of men. As there are three hierarchies of angels in heaven, so on earth there are three classes of the elect. The seraphim, the cherubim, and the thrones who form the first hierarchy represent those who approach nearest to God by contemplation and who differ among themselves according to the intensity of their love, the plentitude of their science, the steadfastness of their justice. To the dominations, virtues, and powers correspond the prelates and princes. And lastly, the lowest choirs signify the various ranks of the faithful engaged in the active life. This is the triple division of men, which according to St. Luke will be made at the last day. Two shall be in the bed, two in the field, two at the mill. That is to say, in the repose of divine delights, in the field of government, and the mill of this life's toil. As regards the two mentioned in each place, we may remark that in Isaiah, the seraphim who are more closely united to God than the rest, perform two together their ministry of sacrifice and praise. For it is with the angel as with men. For the fullness of love which belongs especially to the seraphim cannot be without the fulfillment of the double precept of charity towards God and one's neighbor. Again our Lord sent his disciples two and two before his face, and in Genesis we find God sending two angels where one would have sufficed. It is better, therefore, says Ecclesiastes, that two should be together than one, for they have the advantage of their society. Such is the teaching of Bonaventure in his book on the hierarchy, wherein he shows us the secret workings of eternal wisdom for the salvation of the world and the sanctification of the elect. It would be impossible to understand aright the history of the thirteenth century were we to forget the prophetic vision wherein Our Lady was seen presenting to her offended son his two servants, Dominic and Francis, that they might, by their powerful union, bring back to him the wandering human race. What a spectacle for angels when on the morrow of the apparition the two saints met and embraced. Thou art my companion, we will run side by side, said the descendant of the Guzmans to the poor man of Assisi. Let us keep together, and no man will be able to prevail against us. These words might well have been the motto of their noble sons, Thomas of Aquinas and Bonaventure. The star which shone over the head of St. Dominic shed its bright rays on Thomas. The seraph who imprinted the stigmata in the flesh of St. Francis touched with his fiery wing the soul of Bonaventure. Yet both, like their incomparable fathers, had but one end in view, to draw men by science and love to that eternal life which consists in knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Both were burning in shining lamps, blending their flames in the heavens, in proportions which no mortal eye could distinguish here below. Nevertheless, eternal wisdom has willed that the church on earth should borrow more light from Thomas and fire from Bonaventure. Would that we might here show in each of them the workings of wisdom, the one bond even on earth of their union of thoughts, that wisdom, who ever unchangeable in her adorable unity, never repeats herself in the souls she chooses from among the nations to become the prophets and the friends of God. But today we must speak only of Bonaventure. Bonaventure was born at Bagneria in Tuscany. During his childhood his life was once endangered, and his mother vowed that if her son survived, she would consecrate him to God in the order of Blessed Francis. On this account, while still a youth, Bonaventure begged to be admitted among the friars' minors. He had for master Alexander Hales, and became in a short time so eminent in learning, that at the end of seven years he publicly in Paris explained the books of the sentences with great applause. Later on he also published excellent commentaries on the same book. After the lapse of six years he was elected minister-general of his order at Rome, and he became the object of universal praise and admiration by the prudence and sanctity he had displayed in the fulfillment of this office. 
He wrote many works, which combining the greatest learning with the most ardent piety, at once instruct and move the reader. Urged by the renown of his sanctity and wisdom, Gregory X made him Cardinal Bishop of Albano. He was still while living called a saint by Blessed Thomas of Aquinas, who finding him one day writing on the life of St. Francis, said, Let us allow one saint to labor for another. Bonaventure departed this life on the day before the Ides of July, at the Council of Lyons, being fifty-three years of age. He performed many miracles, and was added to the number of the saints by the sovereign pontiff Sixtus the Fourth. Thou hast entered, O Bonaventure, into the joy of thy Lord. And what must thy happiness be, now since as thyself didst say, by how much a man loves God on earth, by so much does he rejoice in him in heaven? If the great Saint Anselm, from whom thou didst borrow that word, added that love is proportioned to knowledge, O thou who wast at the same time a prince of sacred science, and the doctor of love, show us how all light, in the order of grace and of nature, is intended to lead us to love. God is hidden in everything. Christ is the center of every science. And the fruit of each of them is to build up faith, to honor God, to regulate our life, and to lead to divine union by charity, without which all knowledge is vain. For as thou didst say, all the sciences have their fixed and infallible rules, which come down to our soul as so many reflections of the eternal law. And our soul, surrounded and penetrated with such brightness, is led of her own accord, unless she is blind, to contemplate that eternal light. Wonderful light, reflected from the mountains of our fatherland into the furthermost valleys of our exile. In the eyes of the seraphic Father Francis, the world was truly noble, so that he called, as thou tellest us, even the lowest creatures by the name of brothers and sisters. By the traces left in creation by its author, he found his beloved everywhere, and he made of them a ladder whereby to ascend to him. Do thou too, O my soul, open thine eyes, bend thine ear, unlock thy lips, and prepare thy heart, that in every creature thou mayest see thy God, hear him, praise him, love him and honor him, lest the whole universe rise up against thee for not rejoicing in the works of his hands. Then from the world beneath thee, which has but the shadow of God, and his presence inasmuch as he is everywhere, pass on to thyself his image by nature, reformed in Christ the Bridegroom. From the image rise to the truth of that first beginning, in unity of essence and trinity of persons, that thou mayest attain the repose of that sacred night, where both the shadow and the image are forgotten in an all-absorbing love. But first of all thou must know that the mirror of the external world will avail thee little, unless the interior mirror of thy soul be purified and bright, unless thy desire be aided by prayer and contemplation in order to kindle love. Know that here, reading without unction, speculation without devotion, labor without piety, knowledge without charity, intelligence without humility, study without grace, are nothing. And when at length, rising gradually by prayer, holiness of life and the contemplation of truth, thou shalt have reached the mountain where the God of gods reveals himself, taught by the powerlessness of thy sight here on earth, to endure splendors of which nature was too feeble to give thee an indication. Let thy blind intelligence remain asleep, pass beyond it in Christ, who is the gate and the way. Question no longer the master but the bridegroom, not man but God, not the light but the all-consuming fire. Pass from this world with Christ to the Father who will be shown to thee, and then say with Philip, It is enough for us. O seraphic doctor, lead us by this sublime ascent, of which every line of thy works discloses the secrets, the toils, the beauties, and the dangers. In the pursuit of that divine wisdom, which even in its feeblest reflections no one can behold without ecstasy, guard us against mistaking for an end the satisfaction felt from the scanty rays, sent down to us to draw us from the confusion of nothingness, even to itself. If these rays which proceed from the eternal beauty be withdrawn from their focus and perverted from their object, there will be nothing but delusion, deception, vain knowledge, and false pleasures. Indeed, the more lofty the knowledge and the nearer it approaches to God as the object of speculative theory, 
the more, in a certain sense, is error to be feared. If a man in his progress towards true wisdom, which is possessed and relished for its own sake, is drawn aside by the charms of knowledge and rests therein, thou, O Bonaventure, hesitate not to compare such knowledge to a vile deceiver, who would withdraw the affections of the king's son from his noble betrothed to fix them upon herself. Such an insult to an august queen would be equally grievous, whether offered by a servant or by a lady of honor. Hence thou didst declare that the passage from science to wisdom is dangerous, unless holiness intervene. Help us to cross the perilous pass. Let science ever be to us a means of attaining sanctity and acquiring greater love. Thou hast still, O Bonaventure, the same thoughts in the light of God. Witness the predilection thou hast more than once shown in our time, for these centers where, in spite of the fever of activity which must needs keep in motion every force of nature, divine contemplation is still appreciated as the better part, as the only end and aim of all knowledge. Deign to continue thy protection of thy devout and grateful clients. Defend, as heretofore, the life and prerogatives of all religious orders which are now so persecuted. To thine own Franciscan family be still a cause of increase, both in numbers and in sanctity. Bless the labors undertaken by it, to the joy of all the world, to bring the light as they deserve thy history and thy works. Bring back the East a third time to unity in life, and that forever. May the whole church be warmed by thy rays. May the divine fire thou didst so effectually nurture enkindle the earth anew.